Welcome to the Counting Capital Podcast, presented by Buchanan Street Partners. For informational purposes only and not to be relied on in any manner as legal, business, financial, tax, or investment advice, nothing in this episode is an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy securities. Join our host, Buchanan Street Chairman Robert Brunswick. Hello, my name is Robert Brunswick. I'm Chairman of Buchanan Street Partners, a real estate and investment management firm. And I'd like to welcome you to our Counting Capital Podcast, which we've created to basically provide knowledge to our investors, registered investment advisors, family members, and lifelong learners at large, where we provide topical information about real estate investing, investing uh, more broadly, and specific businesses that we think are appropriate for our listenership to learn more about. It's my great pleasure today to provide you with access to Tony Premer, who used to run run Pack Life's real estate business. And I think you're going to enjoy very much learning about Tony's career and moreover what he did at Pack Life and what he's doing today. Tony, welcome. It's great to have you on the program. Great to be here, Robert. Thanks very much. So let's frame for our, uh, our listenership a little bit about your background so they can understand kind of how you grew up in the business. And you really are one of those unusual characters is in that you haven't had lots of jobs. Uh, You really have, were primarily at Pack Life. But talk a little bit about your career and how you ended up in real estate. Yeah, very good. So, you know, definitely not a job hopper. So I started really my business career with a public accounting firm uh, now known as Deloitte. Sure. And I didn't have any great aspirations for being a partner of one of those firms necessarily, but I wanted to learn about numbers and financial statements and learn a little bit about accounting too. So I spent early part of my career with Deloitte, uh, roughly about three years, learned things about financial statements, learned some uh, basic skills in business, uh, which was helpful later. Ultimately from there, I spent some time uh, moving to an operating real estate company Uh, That real estate company uh, still exists today, but it really gave me a chance to go from one side of the business where I had a chance to review financial statements on behalf of other investors to being an operating partner effectively in a business to see, hey, how does a company run and how do you develop uh, real estate and how do you operate real estate? So really an interesting opportunity there. And then the next stop after that was Pacific Life, where I was for, uh, for 29 years, as you, as you remarked. So uh, interesting spot there as well. And through my career at Pacific Life, I had a chance to work in various types of uh, investment opportunities within real estate, bonds, mortgages, equity, all kinds of different types there, and also across many different property types as well. So all that in summation is a very quick trip through a long real estate career, but it started out as an accountant and ultimately finished as a guy that was running a real estate department for an uh, institutional investor. Perfectly played, uh, great uh, education and uh, real world experience. So as you maybe self-reflect a little bit, Tony, on that, uh, those experiences, and you look at your own attributes, acumen, what your skill set is, what did you learn about yourself and what would you say is really your key ingredients that made you successful in that career path? Yeah. So I, I would say this, look, I think the training that I got was great, but I think you, you learn to be nimble, right? In your career. And, and, you know, the accounting business taught me things like how to test for overstatement or understatement of numbers, like really understand how to be uh, an evaluator of numbers. Are the numbers too high? Are the numbers too low? Um, And I think that's an important skill, a little bit of critical thinking maybe for that particular role. Um, Later on in my career, um, as the world changed, um, you know, look at like the early 90s when the securitization of real estate first began, um, trying to understand structures, trying to understand the underlying collateral for various types of instruments was all very important as well. And then I think, you know, for me, one of the important things, too, was was relationship building, right? Certainly one of the things you have to learn to do, especially as you move up in an organization, is you have to learn to relate to people. And you have to learn to relate to people sometimes on their terms, uh, which is all part of the drill. So in some respects, I had a chance to deal with some of the smartest guys on Wall Street, some really big egos, kind of interesting to deal with those folks. Um, And in other cases, it was something a little bit more homespun, an entrepreneur in real estate that was just trying to figure out how to take his business from point A to point B. So um, for me, looking through my career, um, I think a lot about, uh, you know, the relationships I've developed, you know, the chances to, uh, to create greater skills in terms of the valuation of numbers and the, you know, the analytics, if you will. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you got to be nimble across all those um, components and all those skill sets to kind of get to where you want to be if you're trying to grow in the business. Yeah, I mean, knowing you like I do, I think you've uh, summarized well your attributes, and uh, they clearly have lent you to a very, you know, to your success in your career. Uh, as I think broadly about a life insurance company and how they participate in real estate, I think for many folks who might not understand capital stacks and capital markets, they might not understand how active life insurance companies are in the real estate uh, space. So maybe you can just share a little bit about how they participate in lending and investing and why that collateral and that profile of investment works for a life insurance company. The, so, you know, insurance companies um, are very, very big investors uh, traditionally in fixed income instruments. So that would contemplate bonds, but also contemplates things like commercial mortgages. And so there's a big appetite for the insurance companies. And maybe to take a quick step back, insurance companies typically have a very big appetite to invest long term. And that is largely because a lot of their liabilities as it relates to life insurance policies are long term as well. So if they're taking money in for premiums and they're thinking about um, how they're going to be able to safeguard those dollars as well as invest them over time, the profile for the investments that they typically are looking at are typically going to be longer term assets. And they're also going to be probably higher quality assets, so maybe a little bit lower risk. Um, so there's certainly a balanced portfolio and there's some elements of a portfolio that may have more risk, but on the whole, the summary of the portfolio is it's fairly safe to protect, protect principal, but also to drive return. So if you understand that in terms of what they're trying to do with their portfolios, ultimately what they're looking to do on the real estate side is to find opportunities that generate good risk adjusted returns. And so with that, uh, they look at different property types. They're going to look at different geography. And in the context of a, a commercial real estate investment team that I ran at Pacific Life, our objectives were routinely to try and think about foundational investments that provided a good core return, but also look on the periphery to find things that maybe could get a little extra juice, if you will, a little extra return with a fair amount of risk um, that could add some yield to the portfolio. So that was certainly part of, uh, part of what we did. And that can take the form of an investment in a hospitality asset, right? Not one of the main four food groups, you know, retail, office, industrial, multifamily, but certainly is an opportunity to invest in something maybe with a little bit more return. So I guess the, the key takeaway is, is that the insurance companies routinely are looking for opportunities to invest in high quality assets that provide good risk adjusted returns. And that can take the form of bonds, it can take the form of commercial mortgages, or it can take the form of equity, investing as an equity partner um, in assets uh, as may be dictated by portfolios that have certain demands on that investment activity. Very good, uh, let's make sure if you think about the greater investable space of the insurance company's book of investments, what percentage of that would be allocated to real estate investing as a percentage? And then separately, what's the breakdown of that between debt and equity? Yeah, very good. So the, um, the, the typical profile for most insurance companies for their real estate investment book for overall investment yes. portfolio, typically 10 to 20%. Okay. What you expect. The allocation for Pacific Life was on the higher end of that, um, as an example. Um, so if you think about 20% is in real estate, and if you think about uh, maybe an allocation of 5% to private equity, and then a substantial chunk of the remainder is related to fixed income investments, maybe a little bit of high yield, but mostly high grade or investment grade securities that they're buying, that kind of gives you a, um, a cross-section of what a portfolio might look like. And just to be, so when you say 5%, you don't mean 5% of 100%, you mean 5% of 20%. So it was 1% of the greater book was in equities of real estate. No, no, I was, just, just to be clear, so I was saying within the real estate book of 20%, yes. that number is basically includes all real estate equity and debt. Yes. And the a, private equity would be a 5% allocation would be in addition to the commercial real estate. Got it. Okay. But, but uh, the equities of real estate equity yeah. within your greater real estate allocation of 20% was what percent? It was probably, it was probably about a third of that. Maybe 25% okay, so to a third percentage. of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, because we grew that. I mean, it was once very much, very small, but it, it grew over time. So it became more important and more robust part of the portfolio over so time. So we're going to come back to the equity side, but just sure. to be clear on the debt, which was the mainstay of the real estate investment side, yes. you're not only originating new whole loans on a brand new apartment project, you're also buying CMBS paper. Right. You're buying a lot of instruments where you're just one of many investors that can go in on any day and buy a piece of a fixed income that happens to have real estate collateral behind it. Right, absolutely. Is that fair? That's that's fair. It's fair. So CMBS or commercial mortgage backed securities are just bonds backed by a bunch of loans to commercial real estate. So that's one instrument that we would invest in. Different from a commercial mortgage in that usually the bonds or the CMBS have liquidity. So you can trade those routinely. It's easy to trade those. And that's distinct from a commercial mortgage, which once you originate a commercial mortgage, you hold it. You hold it. You could sell it, but it's very difficult to sell it quickly. And that's a lot different than a commercial mortgage-backed security, which I can call up somebody, a trader on Wall Street, and say, I want to sell this today. What is your bid? And you can transact in that bond almost immediately if you wanted to do that. So, Tony, Pack Life's a big insurance company. 20%, you were overseeing 20% of their investable assets, if you will, on, a, on your whole real estate activity. So how big was your department? How many people worked in real estate? So we had just uh, just a little less than 100 people on the team. My gosh. Uh, frankly, we were always trying to work to get up above 100 because we needed the resources. But with the you know the the changeover and 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 certainly some of the conditions in the marketplace, it was just tip- difficult for us to grow. But we had routinely between 95 and 100 people on the team. So I would imagine your job started to turn into really overseeing people, building culture, maintaining culture, uh, and maybe got out of the day-to-day investment side a little bit, or w- were you still as active as ever in investments with 100 people yourself? Yeah, so you know, with, uh, with a group that size, I, I certainly had a lot more in the way of management and, and, and trying to um, nurture and grow people, obviously. That was an sure. important part of my job. Um, I, I, I always loved the transactional part of it, so I was always eager to be involved in those. But at the end of the day, what I had to do is I had to delegate to a certain extent. And usually I would go and see some of the larger transactions personally, meet the sponsors. Um, certainly was on the investment committee that would ultimately approve uh, those transactions. Um, and you know, I had authority within the institution to approve transactions um, as large as 500 million by myself. but. Routinely, we were looking at things that were smaller than that, and the team just figured out a way to get that done and ultimately run it through its impro- uh, approval channels to, to complete it. But you know, the, the 100 people that are on the team contemplated not only asset originators, but it was also people who were involved in closing and people who were actually involved in asset management after we had originated the asset too. So it was really kind of a, a full production line, if you will, for the investments from beginning when we originated to the end when we basically um, conclude with the investment. So I'd love the listeners to have uh, kind of a, a takeaway. And you know, you took 29 years, but you're going to share it with them here in a moment um, of what were your business? I mean, Pack Life is a premier life insurance company by reputation. You must have had some key business takeaways of what you learned in your 29 years. They must have had a particular culture about them. So just share with us a little bit about what were maybe some takeaways from your pack life experience from a business standpoint that you take forward with you or you message it to others in your life. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the culture that we had to, that we tried to develop and nurture at Pacific Life was one that, first off, we're going to do what we say we're going to do, right? Your credibility in the marketplace and your reputation is, is critical. You know, the moment you start telling people that you're going to do something and then you fail to deliver um, gets around very quickly and, sure. and can have the effect and, and the impact of ultimately of making you unsuccessful in the business. So for us, we always felt like, look, our bond is our word. We're going to make a commitment and tell you what we're going to do, and we are going to deliver. Now, obviously, if something happens in the, in the, in the transaction that's a significant material uh, event or change in the facts of the transaction, then that's, that's room for, hey, let's have a little discussion about what we got here. But fundamentally, I think that was critical. We always tried to say, look, you know, our bond and our, our basically our agreement to do and commit to a transaction, we will deliver. So I think that was critical for sure. Um, and that was particularly important because we were doing a lot of relatively large transactions. And so, you know, that ability to, to deliver certainty for large transactions was particularly important in the marketplace. And frankly, that was our calling card. If somebody had a large transaction, 
and it could be sophisticated, it could be complex. It was our chance to roll up our sleeves and deliver value to the institution by delivering not only diligence, but delivering certainty ultimately to the, you know, to the, to the, to the client who was looking for the money. Sure. So that was all part of it and kind of key for us. So I, I would, so I would identify that as probably one of the key things that we really tried, you know, really tried to do. You know, we wanted to be hardworking. We wanted to be diligent as well. We wanted to make sure that we understood the investment. Um, you know, it's easy to, to um, take what I would refer to as kind of more of an actuarial analysis on a big pool of investments and just try and kind of do a broad brush and apply maybe some sampling and try and figure out what you got. But ultimately, our strategy was to try and dig in deep on larger transactions to make sure we understood the value that we were getting. Um, and so that was kind of a key uh, operating uh, you know, requirement for us sure. in terms of how we looked at it also. Helpful. So as I think about the uniqueness of being able to do both debt and equity investing, a lot of lenders don't play on the equity side. So I think you kind of answered it by saying we, we really got ourselves, we, we knew that real estate as if it was our own, even if we were making a loan. So to wear the hat of being an investor and taking the equity risk, talk, give us an example of what you would invest equity in and why you liked those opportunities. Right. So our, our, uh, <clears throat> our book um, at Pacific Life was um, substantially oriented toward multifamily. And the reason, um, and that's mostly on the debt and the equity side, you know, when we decided in um, uh, roughly 2012-13 to try and expand our equity program, we looked around at adjacencies relative to our debt program and then say, you know, where do we think we can be impactful? So we already had a substantial business of providing construction loans for multifamily developers. We had a huge Rolodex of all the national in players. In the debt seat, not on the equity. De on the debt side, yep. on the debt side. So for us, the logical extension of that was to go out to those same parties and say, look, we want to be an equity investor as well. Um, and so typically the strategy on the multifamily side was to look at opportunities that were uh, fairly substantial projects, usually urban in terms of location, um, they may in some cases have been the best projects in the city under development. Many of them were high rise. We looked at certain times we were looking at um, garden products that we would consider to be maybe somewhere just slightly off urban, maybe, you know, not suburban, but we called it suburban, you know, somewhere between urban and out in the, the suburbs, if you will. Right. Um, but the whole idea was to be kind of close and infill to the, you know, to the, to the opportunities for employment and where people wanted to live. So we were pretty active in that business. And ultimately on the equity side, we wanted to make sure we had the right sponsors, the guys who knew what they were doing and had a demonstrated track record as an enterprise to do those businesses. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you know, the, the capital we were providing was appropriately aligned uh, to the sponsorship. And then finally, and lastly, we wanted to make sure that the project made sense economically, that we could justify all the assumptions on the project. You know, do the rents make sense? Do the expenses make sense? Do the development costs make sense? Because ultimately your pro forma that you start with is merely that, it's a pro forma. You obviously have to prove it at the end of the day to make sure you deliver the returns that you expect to get. Yes, very helpful. And I know you guys, uh, again, to your point, were very active in the multifamily space and doing that joint venture equity investing. So um, as I think about the business today, as we sit here broadly, real estate business versus years back, what is different today than when you started in the business or during the middle of your career as you think about and reflect on it? Yeah. Well, you know, geez, you know, the technology has advanced so substantially and the way we communicate. I mean, when I first started in the business, we were sending facsimiles around, right? We, you know, that's obviously a lot different. I would say also when I, when I first started in the business, um, it was really the beginning of the securitization of real estate. And when I say that, the commercial mortgage-backed security market was just evolving. So your ability to buy a bond backed by a bunch of you know, commercial mortgages in a pooled structure was a novel concept in the 90s, early 90s, sure. basically for sure. So that was a key form of securitization. Another key form of securitization was on the equity side. Real estate investment trust just began to go public then and be, give opportunity for anybody to own a piece of a real estate company. You know, prior to that, basically they were all you know, private companies and maybe you could be a limited partner in some form, but it was very difficult. The REIT uh, market as it evolved gave everybody an opportunity to not only invest, but to buy and sell the securities from an equity perspective, 
what a great tool, right? So if I look back and think about the biggest changes in commercial real estate from when I started to where we're at today, is really that securitization element, right? You, you know, the ability to buy bonds or equity securities that are backed by commercial real estate and be able to trade those and be participants in those. So that's pretty, pretty significant. So, for sure. so the, the uh, evolution of public debt and public equity in real estate, the maturation of the capital markets, which brought more predictability, if you will, to real estate in general. I mean, where more capital has flown to the space, so it's not the doesn't have the volatility that you used to have. And firms like yours really help with that. So you're a young man still. You are you're obviously have had a great storied uh, career at, at Pack Life and, and the prior organizations. So, but I know that you're not done and that you're now kind of pursuing, if I may call it your entrepreneurial chapter. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing today and how your prior experience has really enabled you to kind of leapfrog, if you will, or to take advantage of what you see as a new chapter for you? You know, what I did at Pacific Life is highly impactful to what I want to do now and what I am doing now. <clears throat> and as you mentioned, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial itch that I felt like I wanted to scratch. Sure. So when I was at Pacific Life, what I would see many times is I would see uh, organizations, typically in the multifamily business, who would come and we were looking for capital. Um, and a lot of times they were uh, what I would refer to as kind of emerging businesses, guys that didn't have maybe a lot of enterprise track record, but ultimately they had good bones in terms of the personnel. And from an institutional perspective, you know, the boxes that you need to check to get capital from an institution are typically show me you've got a demonstrated track record as an enterprise, show me you got the capability, and then show me that you can match you know, and provide capital yourself into the transaction to deliver the alignment that the institutions want as well. So a lot of these groups that we saw um, certainly checked those boxes, but there were many that did check the boxes. And they they might have had a worthy project. Worthy project and, and the fundamental bones of the organization, the people were highly qualified, but they had no demonstrated track record as an enterprise. These were kind of fresh entrepreneurs themselves who maybe had left a bigger firm and then joined together with a partner and were trying to launch their own business. Um, so you had those guys. And, and the other thing that uh, they were short on in the box that they couldn't check was just the capital. They just didn't have enough capital to satisfy the alignment requirements of a lot of institutions. So my objective uh, with my entity is to insert myself into those opportunities to not only provide capital, but also try and evaluate some of these enterprises and try and help them nurture and grow to the next level. So I refer to it as a kind of an emerging developer operator strategy where I'll provide capital, provide some maybe some advisory uh, input as well, but ultimately try and help them to get their projects done. And in the meantime, obviously, I'll be taking some of the risk, but I'll also get some return for that too. So it's complementary, and I think it's a, a, a niche that needs to be filled. And I've had some pretty good traction so far in terms of the discussions with various candidates. And I imagine you're, as you said, one of your core competencies of building relationships has really carried you well here because uh, they prob you probably have good access to some interesting opportunities. Yeah, so you know, the platform at Pacific Life was a, was a national and actually beyond platform. So if somebody says, hey, tick off the, you know, the top 15 developers that you work with you know, when you were at Pacific Life, I can give you a national list. Um, but I will also say that some of my earliest calls have been to some of the guys I know who have left some of the big major firms and have shot out on their own as entrepreneurs. And those are the guys that I want to support. And so for me, it's not too hard to make the calls to find out, hey, who's left the shop in the last year or two that launched their own business and get in touch with them if I don't know them already and introduce myself as an opportunity to participate in their transactions. So it's been interesting. Tony, when you and I grew up in the business, there were four food groups, retail, office, industrial, and multifamily. Today, there's 20, 25 asset classes within real estate that all have valid business uh, strategies and opportunities. But as you kind of reflect on today's market, maybe let's be agnostic to the current capital market activities, um, where do you see opportunity as you look at uh, the in investing or participating today? Right. So, I mean, I've always been you know, fond of uh, avoiding the herd for sure. So sure. in today's world, and, and Robert, you know this as well as anybody right now, there's a, there's a lot of capital that's rushing toward the industrial sector. There's a lot of capital going toward the multifamily sec sector. Office has been more difficult, uh, maybe a little bit of um, a vacuum there in terms of opportunities, but also a very risky environment. 
Uh, retail, same thing. Retail seems to be coming maybe out of its trough, um, but still in many cases can be very risky. So, you know, what I try and do, and I'm just always looking for opportunities. I mean, you can say, you know, I will never do an office transaction in any market, but you're really um, nullifying the opportunity to do transactions that may be interesting. There is a price and there is a return for every element of risk that you're going to try and take in a commercial real estate investment. So I think the hardest thing to do is to try and figure out, are you getting paid adequately for the risk you're taking? Uh, we can all agree maybe that, well, you got to get a 7% for a multifamily project and maybe you should get an 18% for an office type project. But ultimately, there's a lot of room in between there. It's a very gray area, right? To try and figure out where is the best place to get return. So I, I hate to um, denounce any particular se sector in the market, but I also think that you got to be careful. So, you know, for, for my book right now, I think I like the multifamily sector, but I also think you got to be careful about what market you're trying to execute in because there's very different um, opportunities, certain states, certain submarkets certain property types too. So, I mean, product types, I should say. So, you know, high rise versus low rise, there's a lot of different opportunities there. So fundamentally, I think you just gotta be careful and it's really a case by case evaluation. And when you think about multifamily, I think demographically where we are with just the aging of our population and uh, senior housing and congregate care and whatnot, um, do you participate in that at all? Or are you strictly uh, kind of conventional multifamily as you look at it? I, th I think for right now, I'm focused on uh, conventional multifamily and maybe with a slight nod to some student housing opportunities. Um, so I, I think that, I mean, fundamentally, I believe the U.S. is underhoused um, and it's still very difficult to, to build in many jurisdictions. Um, there's still some pretty good job growth in some jurisdictions that'll, that'll drive um, demand for sure. Um, so can supply meet that demand? That's the fundamental question of economics, right? Is, you know, what's, what's the right place to be where you're kind of on the power curve as it relates to demand. Um, but in my mind, um, as much as there's all kinds of different property types and look, there's even that there's affordable components. Um, there's obviously independent senior, you know, living facilities, all kinds of things. You know, for me, I would say the objective is to, to stay within more of a mainstream multifamily channel if you will, and then also maybe consider some of the offshoots of that, which in my mind maybe means some student apartment opportunities. Great, I'm glad you said student, because as we wrap here, um, we have a percentage of our listenership that are younger investors, younger career folk, students uh, looking to get into the work world. So what message might you have for them about if you were restarting again, knowing all that you know, what message might you give to that young person who's thinking about a career in real estate or a career in general? Yeah, I think the easy answer is, you know, certainly follow your passion, right? And I, I don't know, I've, I've always loved the, you know, the, the tangible real estate, right? That's just, it's, that's just good, fun stuff. The analytics is fun. Um, but as it relates, there's a lot of different things you can do in real estate, you know, whether you're acting as an intermediary or you're acting as an investor or you're acting as a, a principal, there's lots of things you can do. But I think the key thing is to, is to get experience, you know, across the board early on, um, develop your network. Um, you know, I've been involved uh, in mentoring some young people who are trying to launch their careers in real estate. And uh, the first thing I, and advice I always give them is, you know, start building your network, get out there and start, you know, meet people, you know, try and make an impression, keep in touch with people. You just never know where, you know, those bridges you build can come back and help you later on. So I think that's, that's particularly important. I mean, you gotta, you gotta do your homework, you, you know, you gotta understand the property types. And so, you, you know, you gotta be a little bit self-taught and disciplined and make sure you try and understand the vocabulary and the details. You know, how do you do analysis for certain property types? Um, but I think if you, can, if you can do that and you can develop a network and you can kind of follow your passion within some lane of commercial real estate, I think it can be a tremendously rewarding career. Well, well said from someone who's done it. And I want to just thank you for our relationship. Uh, we sat on a board for a number of years and had great fun. And I would affirm that your attributes of critical thinking and analysis really came to light in that setting and you taught me a lot. So I appreciate that. And I'm sure you've taught our listenership great things today. And hopefully we've had some good learning uh, with uh, Tony Premer, uh, my guest on our Counting Capital podcast. And I'll look forward to seeing all of you next month as we bring you another guest. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Counting Capital Podcast. To learn more about Buchanan Street Partners, please visit our website at buchananstreet.com. Buchanan Street Partners, capital you can count on.